Hello everyone. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me all? Yeah. So, uh, welcome to Security Pulse, uh, your trusted source for insights into cybersecurity and emerging technologies. Uh, I'm Taha Sajid. I'm an author, uh, a cybersecurity or telecommunication architect, and also uh, a father of three kids. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Mr. Kareem, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Kareem Rabi. I'm thrilled to introduce him. Uh, he's a principal telco cloud architect at Red Hat. He has an immersive uh, 20 years of experience in the ICT architecture. His expertise spans across data networks, orchestration domains, uh, bringing AI into telecom, uh, like mobility OS, you know, like a, and the list goes on. He's recognized as one of the top 5G YouTubers. Uh, he run podcast shows. Uh, he held he has held technical key, I mean, key positions with NEC, Nokia, and Huawei. Uh, and he's been driving not only the telecom operators and vendors, but he's also involved in industry working groups like HC, NFE. Uh, he's also a working member of ITU 5G machine learning focus group. And he's just not good in only just technology and telecom. He is also a founder of ScoutX, which is rapidly growing sports tech startup. Uh, that combines his passion for football and technology. So I'm I am really honored to have Kareem with me. Welcome, Kareem, to the show. Uh, thanks, Taha. It's it's really uh, my a pleasure to to be here with you today, and uh, I'm really excited, you know, to to have this one hour with you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Kareem, uh, for coming. So, uh, like for our guest watching this show, uh, uh, to give them some insights about like how we know each other so i've been following kareem uh, i've been his uh, uh, you know silent you know subscribers to his podcast shows i've been watching his you know from every from the time he started this podcast i was actively you know want to see when when is the next show coming up and what he really liked about him is that he just not is really like related to the emerging technologies, but he like like the way he interacts with his followers and with his with his audience in in translating complex things into easy to understand language. You know that is what what really inspired me as well. So yeah, we will start with your journey, Karim. Uh, like uh, in terms of your field, you know, so you have been into like numerous things uh, that what what telecom has to offer. So what has motivated you, and if you can just uh, you know, bring some light into, you know, your early part of your career and what has motivated you to reach to where you are right now. Okay, so uh, classically, I graduated from Faculty of Engineering, the telecommunication section uh, in 2003. And by that time, uh, it was like the 3G was, was very dominant. But uh, my first steps was into the data network part. It was not on the mobile communication. And it came by coincidence, by the way, because uh, during my uh, uh, university years, uh, I used to have uh, Spanish courses. So that was my hobby by that time. I really liked the Spanish. And guess what? After I graduated, uh, France Telecom in Egypt, they were uh, building a new team that supports the uh, network installations in Latin America and in Spain. So basically, they were looking for an engineer who can speak Spanish. And uh, it was only me. <laughs> they actually, they they targeted me. They talked to me, and then I I joined them, and that was my first steps into uh, into the network part. Nice, nice, nice. Very good. Very inspiring. Uh, so you'll you'll teach us some Spanish as well during this during this uh, short podcast. See, 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 Got it. Got it. So uh, you know when we talk about telecom, uh, we talk about cloud architecture. And this cloud has been there for ages now, but it has gone into telecom. It has gone into telecom a bit, a bit late, you know, to my liking. So, uh, when when somebody wants to get into the telecom cloud world, you know, what do you think? What can be the challenges and opportunities? What he has to understand before getting into this journey. Um. I think, you know, what is really exciting about uh, our career, me and you, uh, working on technology and the telecommunication that every, like every two or three years, you know, new technologies uh, rise, uh, new stacks appear. So it all depends on you. I mean, if, if you want to, 
to stay on the learning mode if you want to get into the new technologies then you have to do your your your, your homework and the homework here is actually the the studying part or the learning part so the classic entrance for telco cloud and by the way it was on 2015 uh, that was when the telco started to embrace the cloud technologies the classic entrance in the hcnv specifications because we telco professionals we are very used to to read standards like cgpp and ietf mm -hmm. plus uh, trying to understand the uh, the overall cloud concept uh, from the different sources that you can find online like from hyperscalers from red hat from from the cloud providers so if mm -hmm. if you manage to to mix this Two, two sources of knowledge, uh, most probably you're on the right track to be one of the leads or the experts on the telco cloud. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. And to add it here, uh, what I also see as, as a challenge here is to do something about your legacy architecture. You know, you have to have proper, uh, you know, planning in place about how would you uh, migrate your data and, uh, which public cloud you want to use uh, for your applications uh, whether you will be using multi cloud or you know uh, you know single cloud it all depends on your uh, use case and your and your strategy so this is something which is really important to to have the planning right first upfront you know before moving to the cloud architectures so, um, uh, yeah I, I i agree i agree uh, maybe i focused on the individual part on how actually you know, you could uh, enable yourself to work to work on the cloud uh, track, but but I agree with you. There are a lot of challenges, and actually, we have been through these challenges for the last years. And uh, I, I would just name maybe what one one of the biggest challenges here is that actually, the desire or the intention to adopt a specific technology, if it's not coming from a business motivation or a new revenue stream or a, some sort of a uh, of a business catalyst most probably it will fail and this is one of our challenges in the telco that sometimes most of the operators or some of the operators they they embrace technologies or adopt technologies just for sake of branding or for sake of mm. adopting the technology mm. Mm. and that, that and that was one of the mistakes by the way in 2015 and 16 when all the telcos start to embrace telco cloud but without a clear use case a clear business use case yeah yeah true true and one of the technical challenge i see kareem here uh, in the us is for example, most operators are going with AWS public cloud you know, on their infrastructure. Uh, they don't realize that when you bring in AWS cloud or let's say Azure, whatever the cloud you think, you have to re like rely on their orchestration part, like the platform layer, which is for example, EKS in case of AWS. And, and if you are using Nokia applications, then you have to make sure that your Nokia applications are compatible with your EKS platform, you know, and there's something which you have to like give in and have to make sure that the, like whatever public cloud you're using, they are also compatible with your application and with your use case as well. So this is something which, which is, which is also very important when it comes to the technical challenges and considerations. Uh, talking about 5G, you know, uh, 5G has been now, I think when I started, uh, when I uh, was like halfway into my career in, in Saudi Arabia, you know, there were many operators, you know, trying to use 5G and, you know, migrate from 4G to 5G. And one of the challenge, what I see also here is that, uh, like whoever is using 5G, they cannot monetize 5G to the level what they would like to do, you know? And one of the reasons what I see is, is not having the proper use case or, or propping uh, or proper, you know, strategy, you know? to to do something with 5g so in your experience what do you think what are the top three use cases if any operator let's say wants to adapt 5g and wants to think about hey i should okay i can i can get better tcu or or better roi later but what top three use cases i should be focusing on okay um you know, now it's 2024, so uh, we now have the window to uh, inspect what happened during the last years and talk from mm -hmm. maybe from mm -hmm. a, a more a more confident uh, uh, abstract. So, mm -hmm. still the classic use case is still as it is. It's actually the the what they call the mobile broadband, and it's a it's it's a very classic. So you widen the data pipe, people consume more data, you give them more, more speed, more data rate, so they consume more, mm -hmm. so they pay more. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of the classic uh, 
uh, use cases and still there. And that's the, the thing, that's the, I would say, the priority number one for all the operators, because that's a classic uh, data monetization uh, scheme. The second thing which is coming, and uh, you, you spoke about Saudi Arabia, and I'm here in Dubai, uh, it's the rise of private 5Gs. So uh, that's a, the new vertical of use cases that operators partner with either system integrator or a, or a hyperscaler to provide some sort of a private 5G in a box, whatever in a box. And it, it will look like, uh, for the audience maybe to, to get the feel of that, it will look like the managed wi Wi-Fi, as if you are giving mm -hmm. a managed Wi-Fi mm -hmm. solution for mm -hmm. a factory or a thing. So it's the same thing, but with different quality of service. So it's coming, and I see a lot of a lot of things happening on on, on, on the back end. The, the, the third use case, because you asked me to name three use cases, is actually the, uh, the IoT and the smart, and the smart cities. And I see a lot of cooperation uh, between uh, the mobile operators and the entities who actually run these smart cities, the governmental entities in, in most of the Gulf countries, to do some sort of, some sort of a joint offering for, for smart cities, uh, public safety as well. But if you ask me, till now, it's, it's the classic use case. It's the, the wide is, uh... Uh, data pipeline. Very, very well said, very well said. And you know, uh, there is a... Uh, like catch here that people are to monetize 5g or to or to position themselves better they may try like they may try out different use cases and do a research or for example network slicing is, is one use case you know they can try out uh, uh some you know like m like ultra reliable low latency use case but the actual application is is less to what like what they can sell out you know and uh, you talked about private 5G. So one of the challenge here, here because you in the US, like a lot of operators are going towards a private 5G a use case where they are using DSDS as a technology uh, on the UE side, you know, to search. But the problem of that, what I see is that there are, so for example, if you are using uh, a SIM where, where you are using like Verizon as your main network, and you are, if you're using DSD, like DS to offload your traffic into a private 5G network, which is, a, let's say a tier three operator coming up like an MVNO, which is, which is offloading the traffic you are offloading the traffic to, but then you have to think about the other use case that, Hey, if I'm getting into the coverage of both the operators, you know, how my subscriber will add into my network, you know, and what are the challenges that if, if I need to do some troubleshooting, you know, so it has its own challenges as well. So private 5G, yes, it's, it looks fancy, but it has to be properly planned, you know, and you need to have proper resources for that as well. Who can, who can, uh, who can guide you into this journey? Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. And, uh, and most of the activities happening on, on the region here are more into demos and, and pilots and, and, uh, Demos are, are valid here because uh, you need to make sure that these use cases make sense for 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 your end customer, right? So if you if you are targeting uh, a specific industry segment, mm -hmm. then you need to demonstrate this technology for that uh, industry segment because we have to acknowledge that these industry segments have been using other technologies other than five G since since like uh, many years. So this is yeah, not something yeah. new for them. You are, you are trying to give them a, a replace a replacement with with additional value. So yes, mm -hmm. as you said, it, 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 it's facing some uh, difficulties in, in, in reality. But again, again, this is a classic uh, use case for the uh, cooperation between mobile operator and hy hy hyperscalers and system integrators. So they, they cooperate to tailor one private 5G solution. And some, in some cases, they don't go for a classic uh, capex model that telcos used to have no it's more like a revenue sharing model so we have our solution it can be provisioned in zero touch provisioning we mm -hmm. sell it together mm -hmm. even if if a hyperscaler or si have good connection with an enterprise customer so let's let's go together we have a mm -hmm. joint go to market and we sell together mm -hmm. so that's also a shift in the mindset uh, I mean, uh, coming from the 5G. Yeah. Got it. And it's about, you know, uh, if, I, if I have to summarize what you have just explained and just uh, easy to understand thing, you know, for our operators watching this show, you know. So if you have to sell your desert, it's about selling your like main course really well, which is the classic 
5G use case. Whatever quality of service uh, promise that you have given to your customer for the for the QoS and for latency, whatever, stick to it and make sure that you are delivering that good. That would give you the numbers that what you are looking for. Okay, very good. So uh, moving on, I'll uh, slightly focus ourselves towards the AI. What everyone is talking about, you know, in conferences here in the US, you know, or anywhere in the global, you know, AI is the talking point uh, of many conferences and it has been shaping uh, telecom industry as well. Uh, so uh, if I if I have to ask you that, you know, in terms of innovation, what are the domains of telecom where you really see the potential of AI penetrating? Okay. So you know that classically AI have been always there in, in our roadmaps, you know, if you are a vendor yeah. and operator, just an integrator. So in the last five years, or last 10 years, whenever someone tries to show a roadmap for technology, it, it's yeah. classically positioned at the end. But now I think we, we are in that in that stage. So uh, we, we are now like trying to bring solid use cases. So you asked me about uh, the, uh, the, the segments on the teleco where the AI use cases are started to 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 to, ap to appear and started to be embraced, so um, you know that the, the, the teleco enterprise is, is is complex because there are a lot of layers, a lot mm -hmm. of uh, you know, you mm -hmm. know that there's the BSS, the OSS, uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the even the service layer. There's another mm -hmm. big layer of resources like uh, data centers and cloud stuff. So, and mm -hmm. even there's the enterprise layer itself, the look the the internal enterprise. So so if you ask me the one of the most mature uh, area in the in, in telco, it's actually the BSS, uh, because there where you have this kind of marketplaces, where you have the digital apps, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there you find a lot of AI use cases uh, about uh, recommending products uh, based on certain pattern, uh, uh, somehow predicting uh, customer behaviors, um, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. there you can even, you can, you can record the customer journey, they call it customer journey in the BSS, mm -hmm. and based on all of multiple customers, multiple journeys, you start to have some logic that give you yeah. some sort of predictions. So it is there, classically, but in our part, in, in the network, in the telco, or not telco, like the, the main operations, so AI is there classically, uh, whenever you find an orchestration layer in any, in any layer, for example, in the OSS, doing uh, this kind of provisioning service assurance, now the AI solution are there because you have a lot of data uh, trapped, tracked, sorry, from the network function and from the cloud. You know, classically, mm -hmm. telecos, they have some sort of umbrellas that collect uh, fault management and performance management and logs from different layers on the, from, the, uh, from the network. So in that layer or in the OSS, that's where you find the teams working on data warehouses. And that's where mm -hmm. you can start to position AI-based solution that gives you multiple values. For instance, you can use uh, AI solutions for uh, predictive maintenance. So uh, we used to have some sort of a, uh, uh, thinking with the orchestration that you can do a closed close loop control. So you get you get some input data and that hits a specific logic and then you, you apply a corrective action. But now with pre predictive maintenance, you can even apply the corrective action or preventive action before the the action occurs. Uh, uh, another uh, another um, explicit positioning of AI comes now with the new technology evolving. I know that you are interested also in, in ORAN. I can see that. For example, in ORAN, it comes natively with with an architecture that that refers to existence of an AI engine. Uh, in the five G, you can have now there is an explicit mention on having. Uh, the data analytics function or network data analytics, so you can take actions based on data analytics. Uh, maybe that 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 that, that might, might might look a little bit, uh, I would say, basic for for some professionals. But for us, for telecoms, that's something because we, we we didn't have that before. We didn't have an explicit uh, architecture that that mandates existence of 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 that kind of AI engine. So, as a summary. You'll find it with the with the new technology architecture as a, as a main brick, like in the ORAN, in the 5G. You find it in the BSS classically, and that has been there for a while. And also classically, it's there in the OSS doing this kind of preventive maintenance. And for sure, there's a lot of other use cases now being being worked on, being demoed 
especially with, with the introduction of Gen AI. I really like how you have, you know, make this, uh, explain this topic, you know, because when I think about AI, I think about, you know, I can use AI everywhere, you know, the amount of productivity and the efficiency it can bring uh, to the organization and the architecture, but making sure that you understand the use cases before you implement technology is, is really important. And talking about AI, then we, we know like Gen AI is really coming into its of of, of its own age and it's really evolving and every enterprise, especially like the telecom enterprise are having now its own GBD models, you know? So in terms of the architecture, uh, we, we were like, like, I mean, we have seen like 5G since it's, it's been mainly 3GP driven, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, from different working groups, but over and since there's some customization going on into like every vendor is trying its own one thing, how they can come into this ORAN ecosystem. And there are also coming up with some Gen AI use cases as well. So in terms of uh, your view of the things, where do you see Gen AI can really make its mark in the ORAN, in the ORAN as well as in the 5G architecture? Okay. So uh, in the same way, as, uh, I mean, I, I, when we talked about the 5G, we said we are in 2024. So now we have a good window of, of confidence to, to, to comment on what happened during the last years. Mm -hmm. So now when you ask about Gen AI, we have to acknowledge first that uh, the AI, even the machine learning, I mean, with the classic definition, I wouldn't say it's not yet adopted widely at the telcos. Okay, mm -hmm. so when we talk about Gen AI, and that's very aligned to the latest survey done by TM Forum, that it looks like most of the telco operators, tier one operators, are interested interested to deploy Gen AI, and now we are in the phase two, trying to uh, articulate or come with use cases. So the use cases that I've I've seen and. Uh, because also of my connections with, with the vendors of the orchestration vendors, because it's classically uh, the orchestration vendors, like the big names, like uh, Netcracker, Blue Planet, those people are focusing on the orchestration. They are now uh, shifting or trying also to bring uh, more AI, you know, bright capabilities into their solutions. So for instance, the Gen AI in the orchestration level, uh, we used to have some sort of a design time and runtime. Runtime, that's where we you have the orchestration engine, that's where you you know mm -hmm. push configuration, apply policies. Mm -hmm. And the design design time, that's where you design the uh, mm -hmm. service or design mm -hmm. the, the logic. Uh, the evolution by that time was to give you some sort of a nice GUI to start drag and drop and build the service based on mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But the new evolution that we see now from these vendors is that you can actually uh, use Gen AI to construct that kind of visual diagram. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. instead mm -hmm. of doing the drawing, you talk with, uh, with the engine, mm -hmm. you tell that, you know what, I am looking to do uh, an enterprise B2B X service. Then he said, mm -hmm. yes, okay. So what, what are the components of this service? You start to talk. So you design the, the service from Gen AI. So that, 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 that's, a number, that's a use case that I, I, I'm seeing now in the some of the orchestrators and even in the ORAN, ORAN side specifically. Another classic Gen AI and also based on the survey is actually the, the internal uh, chat GPT or the internal knowledge knowledge uh, git of mm. the of the mm. of the enterprise. So you know this kind mm. of idea has, has always been there to like every vendor, every every operator has its own internal mm. git of knowledge. So, and mm. and this is happening on the enterprise, local enterprise level. So these these are the two uh, the two use cases, uh, but again, we need to acknowledge that we have some effort to do to actually map the, the classic AI use cases into production and then go on to Gen AI. And because we don't want to do the same mistake of adopting a specific technology or trend without a clear use case that brings benefit. Yes, yes, yes. Very good, very good laid out. Uh, a couple of things I need to add on or that this is how I feel about the use of Gen AI in, in the telecom world. So when we start about, uh, when we start, let's say a planning stage of, let's say we want to do a 5G architecture, 
or, or let's say an orchestration platform to deploy pods in an in an hyperscaler let's say so every vendor has its main product which is which they use for the orchestration part like nokia uses ncom like huawei uses their own u2000 o2000 you know all those all those like platforms and the thing is they collect to orchestrate the data or to actually deploy the applications you have to rely on some configurations you know you have to rely on some design inputs which which can come in the form of hld you know lld you know ipciq you know all those things that comes and get into this helm charts configurations and on all those things you know so there i see a good use case where you can develop a model to 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 feed those data and you can get those output instead of bringing in five resources design resources paying hundred of thousand of dollars to the tier one vendors you can have your own model where you can have let's say one engineer which you can have just to review those scripts review this thing and you you'll be done so this way you can yeah. uh, like decrease your manpower uh, the second use case what i see is in the security aspect so when you, when you are doing let's say an operations you know like the managed services either huawei nokia rx and whoever is doing managed services you have to rely on security guys if there is a security incident you know so you can use your train your model to with your data sets which can get you the right impact of your of your incidents to like to quantify that hey this is a false positive versus this is a really impactful thing and where you need to develop a patch for example so so, so these two are are some of the good use cases which can save you some cost but as kareem said out that you know before you think about a lot of things and, and you know you, you know full your plate think about a classic use case and how you can you know make sure that the ai really makes sense for you and then maybe do a research and try to integrate your research items with with something like a like a pilot project uh, and then you can scale it from there so you have to plan those things really really carefully i okay, i, I, I agree is... uh, Taha, and, and actually your point is, is very aligned with with the design point of the orchestration so it seems like at any design stage of whatever technology, it makes sense to, to, to have a Gen AI because, because we all know this kind of output of design phase, which is the HLD, LLD, these artifacts, it's like 90%, it's it's well defined construct and you can just fit with, with variables. So sure. somehow, yeah, that, that, that can be uh, handled by Gen AI, I agree. Now I'll, I'll, I'll focus ourselves uh, uh to some of the industry related groups like industry working groups so I'm, I'm being part of the 3gpp you know sa3 group initially then i've uh, been into sa2 group and i worked a bit about oran groups as well so what i what i felt is in those discussions it's more of a you know, a parliament house where everybody is is pitching their own own policy and you have to make sure that you have the numbers if you have to agree with, with a particular standard or, or you know, pitch yourself, like whatever thing that you are doing, you know. Uh, so in terms of your experience with working with Etsy, with working with different industry groups, are we uh, taking the right, like is like, so my question is like, are the operators really taking the insights of from those standards? Because here we are talking about release 19 almost getting finished. You know we are working on 6g and vendors are coming up with release 16 release 17 softwares you know uh, so there is a gap what i see in what uh software the vendor is actually using in the production to where the industry is going so uh, how do you see this like are we really taking the advantage from all those industry groups and can those industry groups can be converged into one table like oran 3gpp let's say uh you know like gsma and you know so how do you see all this all this going on well it's a it's a, it's a tough question <laughs> but uh but yeah I, i've been i've been i've been living i mean in this kind of uh questions and insights about different uh groups for, for maybe for, for the last uh, nine or ten years so let's take it let's take it one by one okay why teleco telecommunication in particular needs standardization. For instance, what, why the other industries, they don't have standardization, okay? So classically, classically, uh, building mobile networks, 
starting from 2G, 3G, 4G, has all followed the standard approach. For instance, uh, if you are building a mobile network, most probably, most probably, uh, I'm not talking about single vendor solution, single vendor uh, mobile operator. Usually, that requ that require integration with different vendors. Usually, you know the classically the radio, the core, the CS, the PS, the IMS, and you know the IT, the VAS, the OS, the BSS. It, you know the teleco, what, what we call the telecom application map. It's co very complex. So if you leave this complexity without a kind of standardization that stand, standardizes the architecture and uh, the interfaces, it will be a mess. Especially that that mess, this mess A integrate with mess B, mess C in the roaming scenario. So it's not just even a standalone uh, integration. It's a lot of roaming uh, scenarios. So if you don't go with the standardization, then, then you're dead. And that what gave uh, 3GPP the strengths and you know the, the, the consents from everyone that yes, we need to follow 3GPP. What happened actually starting from 2015 that we started to see a lot of SDOs producing publications under the name or under the title standards. So we have a lot of initiatives as you named. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the we have the ATNV, and uh, we have the ORAN Alliance. We have even another one, uh, the coming. It's called ORAN, not, not ORAN Alliance. And we have even the the uh, the. Uh, the IETF, we have the GSMA publication. So we started to see a lot of fragmentation in the market because if you have six mm. standards, then, then you don't have standard. Mm. And then the well-known debate has started. Like the new uh, joiners or the new uh, professionals coming into teleco, coming from different backgrounds, coming from cloud coming coming from software development they start to question mm -hmm. i mean guys come on why do you need standards i mean to build the cloud why why do i need to have to you know because you know standards the the cycles take a lot take a lot of, a lot of much time like for example months and maybe year to produce a mm -hmm. draft and as you mm -hmm. said uh, there should be some approvals and it's it's not a secret i mean uh, if for example let me name some if ericsson want left most probably how you will need will Right, and you know there are a lot of yeah. conflicts there. Yeah. So why do we need that in the cloud? So we unfortunately discovered late that you know what, building a cloud is not is different from building a mobile network. So sometimes standard makes sense, and sometimes, and I'm 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 a I'm a standard uh, guy. <laughs> I've been loyal to the standard for for all my life, but at at some technologies. You have to leave the innovation and the and this kind of uh, uh, community work to flourish. You cannot bind that into the standard cycles of standardization. So, in some technologies, we still need the standards. Five G, that's fine. Others, I would say, standards should only stop what we call on level one or level two. And level one, level two in standards mean just giving you a high. You know the architecture, maybe some use cases, mm. but how mm. to do it? No, that, that's that, that that's really too much. And we saw that, and, and I will I will finish my uh, statement for this one. See the rise of containers or containerization in telco. A lot of a lot of operators did did that on the IT. Even some did that in the telco, mm. while its NV even was not was not ready. And then. Out of nowhere, we found a publication saying, yeah, you know what? There are new function blocks, something called CISM. No, the technology has been adopted mm. and people mm. are, are already generating use mm. cases. Mm. So, so yeah, it's uh, my, my, my opinion is some technologies, classic technologies require standardization. Uh, 3GP is, is an example. ORAN also is an example because at the end, it's, it's, it's a functional technology. But when it comes to orchestration, to cloud, no, let's, let's leave that to the community. True, true, true. You know, uh, I totally agree with you. And you bring up a very interesting point. Uh, I wanted to go to my next question, but I mean, <laughs> this, this is a very, very touchy topic you know, for, for me as well. So there is a good use case uh, in security, in telecom security of using eBPF, you know, uh, 
EBPF yeah. is uh, is been there for for ages now and it's really a wonderful thing and wonderful tool which you can use to really tune that kernel uh and it's really evolving you know but when it will come as a part of telecom security space i don't know you know some enterprise are using their by their choice and they don't have like have any standards so vendor is playing playing with them that hey if you want to use this use our version of ebpf so there is like it's not going anywhere second good use case is about zero trust security so i was part of that working group where we have like maximum members if 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 i have to count out in a group is is a, is for the zero trust security where we have 30 organizations coming in and with those 30 organizations they are only tackling a small part of zero trust which is only for the control plane only for the ue related threats coming in what about data plane what about management plane you know okay leave it to other other groups you know so we are not going anywhere as an in industry so like coming back to your point that we have to just focus on what is the really telco specific use case and just leave the other like say cloud security to some of the other organization which are doing and and let the enterprise handle those things individually exactly okay uh coming then uh, uh you know you have been always passionate about sports you know uh, passionate about soccer you started the scout x kareem uh, so tell me more about scout x what is scout x what has motivated you and you know how you can like how you are bridging your your technology expertise with your football expertise yeah uh, i i i grew up in 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 cairo in egypt and uh, you know uh, uh, we have uh, mohammed salah now playing in liverpool so uh, if you ask me i'm 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 43 years old and if you ask even the community of, of the footballers in, in Egypt, if you ask him, was Mohamed Salah like the best talent by that time? No, the answer was no. There are, there are a lot of other talents, maybe have more like a flair or dribbling like Salah, but they, they were never seen. So, uh, and me, when I was young, I, I used to play football. And um, it, it's not a secret, my friends know that I, I really wanted to be a, to be a football player or a soccer player. <laughs> And uh, that that was the motivation for me to 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 come up with the uh, with Scoutex. Scoutex it's 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 a digital platform uh, that actually uh, helps the uh, the talents anywhere in the world. I mean, to showcase their their skills. Uh, if you are a parent, if if you are a player, if you are a coach, you can just start to build your digital profile on Scoutex. And uh, we, we we are giving you the right platform to connect with the with the clubs, with the scouts, with the agents. And uh, we have created that, that that kind of of digital platform. And uh, somehow we are doing. I mean, we have we have a good traction. Somehow we have almost uh, seven thousand players. We are in uh, six countries, and uh, we have over like uh, seventy plus football academies uh, using uh, scout. Mashallah, Mashallah, very good. Yeah, and we are we are preparing for some something big uh, in the next uh, two months, inshallah. So can we uh, can we expect you uh, giving a webinar for for soccer skills, uh, <laughs> showing some? <laughs> <or something? laughs> so yeah, that's good because uh, uh, my uh, my son lately, I want he's really into soccer these days, and I'm finding him some academy where he can go, and you know, but you know, I have to I have to drop him, pick him up, and you know, it will it will be. Uh, lot for me you know <laughs> so, so i'm thinking like i'm like a webinar or something which i can have him enrolled and he can start learning his yeah. skills you know remotely yeah well um yeah i mean uh, and you see there are a lot of missed opportunities for, for both sides i mean there are a lot a lot of talents in everywhere in south america in africa and 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 they were never seen but uh for for for, for the start of itself it, it it has a story because um uh, you know, uh, like most of us, we have been focusing in the corporate business and, uh, you know, we have been doing this, uh, you know, you, you, you said that in the introduction, I, I worked in, in many companies like Nokia, Huawei, uh, System Integrators, NEC, uh, STC, uh, Orange, France Telecom. So I was like, you know, in highly engaged with, with, with the corporates. And then I, 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 I've always had this dream on, on having my own startup about, about football. 
And then when I, uh, like two years back, I did some surveys, tried to meet some of the, you know, uh, big names in the uh, mm -hmm. startup and the uh, entrepreneurship mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And then one, one guy told me, he told me a very good statement, a very good advice. He told me that, see, you want to do something. This is your dream, right? I said, I said yes. Mm -hmm. He said, you have, you have two options. Either you do it or you will not do it. If you don't do it, you will always blame your, you will always blame yourself for not doing it for the rest of your, your life. Why didn't I do that? And if you do it, you have the other two options. Either you succeed and then you, you achieve your dream or you fail. But at least you, 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 you have made like, a, you didn't miss the chance. I mean, you, you will never, you, you're not blame yourself because you did what, what you wanted to do. So uh, that actually, you know, uh, shaked me. And uh, then I, I had this kind of contact with, with my friends who had the same, same interests. And we did it. I mean, uh, and one year back, we were uh, somehow, we got uh, selected by one, one of the incubators in Dubai to, to incubate the, the company for three years. So we moved from Egypt to Dubai. And uh, yeah, here we are. Nice, nice, mashallah. Very, very inspiring, Karim. Very inspiring. And uh, uh, just to add on to your last point, so when you try, you got two options. Was like, like, like that's what I think. One is success. Obviously, you will, you will make it through. The other one is that you will learn. You will not fail. You will learn from it. You know. So people watching, you know, this show and you know, uh, or listening to us. So like, 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 so guys, if you have a dream, just go for it. You know. There is no better time now, you know, because it's, you have the resources, you have, you have people, you know, who can, who can teach you on YouTube. You can see a lot of, uh, websites, you know, uh, and just go out and, and try out, you know, uh, there is always a learning that you will have it and, and try to get this learning and use it to, to, to excel the next time that you will try. So just do it. And and and, okay. and Taha, because some 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 colleagues contacted me. I mean, when I when I announced that I, I have Scott X, many colleagues contacted me, and they are in corporates, and they all wanted to do that. So they they were asking me, w w was it difficult for you to start a startup at that age? And uh, to you know, that's very you know the, the 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 way of thinking, the mentality is completely different. So my, my advice is that it's, it's never too late. I mean, you can still do it. And guess what? Your work on the corporate will help you a lot because you have experienced a lot working with these corporates. Uh, you, you are doing implicitly a pitch every day. I mean, in your work, either to sell a service, to sell a package, to, to do your work. It's, it's just some sort of pitch. So it's, there's, it's it's a little bit different, but still you are doing it, and 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 it helped me. And uh, if you have the uh, the uh, the right support from from the family and from the friends, and and for sure if if you don't have any kind of uh, conflict of interest or legal issues with your employer, then then yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Make sure that you, what you are doing, you are doing it safely. That's that's that. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So uh, moving on to now the last section of the show. Uh, so I've seen your workshop recently where you have, uh, you know, like collaborated with, I think like Lab Labby, what like was it? Uh, to to, Lab Lab, yeah. to deliver the bootcamp and, you know, it was very successful. I see, I, I see lots of likes, lots of, uh, lots of comments there. So if somebody like who is into the telecommunication space or like, like say like 10 years, He's into radio, you know, UE side, RF, RF side, core, whatever. And he wants to excel in his career. You know, what, what guidance will you give him that, Hey, just do this two, three things. Maybe go to these, these two, three platforms, get a mentor or how do you, how do you get him the next kick, what he needs in his career? Okay. Uh, let's first agree on, on, on the cornerstone that working in, in technology in general means that you need to keep your profile sharp so you need to stay always in the learning mode because if you if you skip a specific wave of technology most probably you'll be left behind so this is very very clear 
So you have always you know, to be keen on learning new, new stuff. Uh, I just want to give an example of, of, of my, my career, uh, not, not an advice, but just, just like my, my experience, okay? So in 2015, I was a senior uh, core consultant working on the packet core. And now I'm a principal architect in Red Hat. In 2015, it, it might look a little bit uh, awkward, but I didn't know that Red Hat exists. I didn't know what, what's actually Red Hat, what is Mirantis. Even I didn't know what, what, what is anything, like what is VMware. I, I didn't know anything about those, those players, okay? And now I'm a principal architect in, in Red Hat. So do you, do you think that I worked on Red Hat or my colleague worked on AWS because he's expert in Red Hat or AWS? No. So the second point that I want to talk about it is actually your experience in the telecom, that's what makes you have a strong profile. So uh, build on top of that, try to go left and right because Taha, you gave an example of someone with 10 years of experience. 10 years of experience, you shouldn't be focused on something, on one thing on having and staying in your comfort zone. You have to start to gradually see the end-to-end -end picture, okay? So you go to the cloud, you go to the automation, you go to the AI, see the BSS, these kind of things. But protect your core strengths. This is my advice because some some colleagues or some professionals, they think of something called uh, career shift. There is nothing called career shift in technology. You cannot, for example, leave the mobile code where, where you are expert in and suddenly uh, you take uh, a Python course and, you know, I, I'm going to be a Python expert. No, just make use of your code trends and move to Python. And that what what makes you different and unique in, in the market. And this is this is, again, my story and even my, my colleagues and my friends story. They all shifted from telecom, moved to AWS, moved to VMware, moved to Red Hat, not because they are experts in the cloud, but because they have the end-to-end -end picture and they have the core telco experience so keep up the core telco experience maybe maybe Taha, i can maybe uh, listen to your ref reflection and then we can talk about the platform yeah i actually as as you were speaking i was uh thinking about my journey as well and the point that you have mentioned is totally valid and i can totally relate to this so to my audience, I also share you a bit about my experience as well. I started my career as a CS core engineer uh, back in 2010-11. Uh, when I moved into Huawei after like five years, I was mainly doing the CS work. Okay, but then I realized that hey, I should not be sitting in my comfort zone. And what I really wanted out of my life is just not doing this nine to five doing some you know you know stp analysis or or msc analysis you know doing some configuration I, sh I should be thinking more about what i can give to the marketplace so then i started exploring more technologies about how i can learn more technologies blockchain cyber security uh, are some of those technologies and i started when i understood those technologies i started to apply those technologies into the telecommunication knowledge what i have what happened was two three years I got into I got an opportunity to do a security audit for a big tier one operator, you know, which is having the tier one vendor products on it to do the security assessment. Why I got this opportunity because I was learning cyber security as and I was good at telecom, you know, so my management thought that, hey, I'll be the one who can assist in this role. And from that, from there, I got the chance to use my skills gain the experience and the next opportunity i got is a principal security architect for 5g you know so what things what you know as as karim pointed out that try to learn new things and try to make sure that whatever you are learning you can apply those skills into your main core knowledge which is telecom or software or whatever the industry belongs to you know and keep pushing forward no matter what the world is saying that hey you are changing your career you know why you are changing why you're moving from telecom to python you know just don't listen to this noise just do it whatever you think would be good for you uh, exactly Tom. yeah so that's exactly what, what my take is yeah yeah so uh yeah uh yeah Karim, you want to add something no no i mean for for for, for the platforms uh there, there is a gap in the, in the market when it comes to technology hands-on uh curriculums of work 
and that's why I really like uh, Lab Lab and I'm, uh, like what they are doing because they are mixing their labs are positioned to the telecom sector so they are mixing the technologies you can for example you can get 5g experience about classic 5g cores with deployment on kubernetes so you, you get the cloud touch so for me i, I mean for telco profile for telco professionals this kind of labs are very useful but if you don't have the this chance to go with, with them you have to do like what the hell is saying that you can get, for example, some cloud, cert cloud certificates, like uh, this kind of introductory clouds. But try always to map whatever you do in your zone, in your in your area, in your, in your core uh, expertise. Uh, when you do that, first of all, you will excel in, in, in your job, and that will give you opportunity to get more tasks, to get more uh, exposure. And that's what happened mm -hmm. to Baha. And the same thing, mm -hmm. exactly that happened to me. Uh, also, that will make your your, prof your profile sharp and broad. Uh, I like the term of uh, you, you can do like some sort of a experience career portfolio. So you have a portfolio of, of, of experiences. So now you have your core your core uh, expertise, and then you go a little bit to cloud, and you go a little bit to automation, you go a little bit to AI, and this is actually mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Very good, very good, uh, Karim. Uh, let us open our floor to uh, some of the Q&A's. Uh, let us see if we have any questions. Uh, let me see. Rabia, did you get any questions from our guest, uh, from our uh, attendees, or if you have any questions to Kareem, uh, we have him with us. Please feel free to ask. Yeah, there is an interesting comment, Kareem, that uh, we use the word, we have been hearing this word metaverse, you know. So, uh, is there any uh, use case that we can think maybe in 6G of, of uh, metaverse coming in more into the telco space? Well, the, the uh, see, again, <laughs> our, our, our uh, like, uh, technology field in general, the it has a lot of buzzwords okay so we have also we have all to acknowledge that it's it's a lot of buzzwords sometimes the buzzword reflects a reality sometimes just a just a buzzword so mm -hmm. 6g is, is is still open for uh, for the uh, proposal and suggestions uh, me personally I, I had some proposals uh in the uh uh, in, in in one of the in one of the ITU sessions, for instance, uh, in the 6G, we are talking about the AI native network. It's a it's a buzzword at the end, but it has a definition. Everyone has its own definition of AI native. Uh, there could be some some use cases uh, for for metaverse because I'm in Dubai, so I know that operators here in in, in the UAE are interested to explore these use cases. So yes, there there, there might be. Very good. Uh, thank you, Karim. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you. Um, I'm sure that our audience have find this discussion a very, very insightful, very interesting. Uh, we got the chance to learn about you a lot uh, uh, from your journey, from your experience, and, and especially, you know, how the telco world is transforming and evolving. Uh, we talked about different use cases, AI, you know, in orchestration domains, you know. Uh, it's been it's been an absolute pleasure having you. Uh, thanks, Taha. Uh, same here. I'm I'm really happy to finally meet you and uh, talk to you. And uh, I hope that we can have maybe another episode uh, soon. Sure, sure. It's it's a lot to talk about, guys. And you know, it's it's one hour is really you know no time. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I mean, thank you for watching us. Uh, thank you for coming into this platform, joining this discussion. Uh, I'm Taha Sajid, uh, uh, wishing you all the best in your career. And please uh, feel free to, you know, reach out to me or Kareem if you need further guidance. Uh, and please don't uh, forget to follow and subscribe Security Pulse, uh, where we keep, you know, uh, you know, developing and bringing this engaging content to you. Uh, until next time, goodbye. Thank you.